armies of God would give a shout and, and the, it would terrify the enemy. They would say, there's a God in the camp. We have a God in the camp. Time in a little while. All right, so we're going to start off. Confrontations like these are a regular feature of modern American life as people apply their beliefs and values to the issues of the day. While some may desire to see protesters turn down their anger, loud and heated public arguments about morality, faith, and life and death have been an important part of the American story for more than 250 years. Today, we use terms like liberal and conservative to describe the many people and groups who organize such demonstrations. But as we look back at the last few centuries, we will see that these labels don't serve us very well. Faith has played a central role in many of our nation's most important and most divisive debates, which is only natural as people apply their deeply held beliefs to the many challenges of the world. Christians have played an important role in American public and political life from the beginning. But that doesn't mean people of faith always speak with one voice on social issues. In fact, members of various churches and faith traditions have frequently found themselves on opposing sides of these issues, often pursuing different priorities and outcomes. The one thing they do have in common is that people of faith share a common desire to battle principalities and powers, to usher in their vision of a better world and often see themselves as rebels with a cause. America was born out of rebellion against European powers. And during the Revolutionary War, most people of faith found themselves either on the patriot or the loyalist side. Many Christians in the American Revolutionary time were patriotic and intensely so, and some felt that it was a matter almost a religious principle to support the patriots in opposing parliament. On the other side, there were quite a number, not probably as many as the patriots, but quite a number of those who felt that Christian principles demanded loyalty to the mother country. This group included some who were actually quite uh, critical of, of Britain's action but they felt that the moral problems had not reached the place where it was necessary to uh, promote independence. After the Boston Tea Party of 1773, patriots became convinced that God was on their side in the battle against England. Some patriots even compared their own struggle for liberty to the Exodus story of the Old Testament. John Witherspoon, a Presbyterian minister from Scotland was the only clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence. In a sermon delivered at Princeton University, Witherspoon proclaimed a patriot gospel that pictured God siding with the revolutionaries, not their distant rulers. The ambition of mistaken princes, the cunning and cruelty of oppressive and corrupt government ministers, and even the inhumanity of brutal soldiers, however dreadful, shall finally promote the glory of God. And in the meantime, while the storm continues, His mercy and kindness shall appear in prescribing bounds to their rage and fury. On the other hand, loyalist sermons compared American revolutionaries to the angel Lucifer, who rebelled against God in heaven and with Adam and Eve, who rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden. Miles Cooper was the president of King's College, and like many loyalists, he was a member of the Church of England. When once the people conceive the governed to be superior to the governors, and that they may set up their pretended natural rights in opposition to the positive law of the state, they will naturally proceed to despise dominion and speak evil of dignities, and to open a door for anarchy, confusion, and every evil work to enter. My own sense as a historian is that there were probably pretty good Christian reasons for all positions, for remaining loyal, for 
for objecting to Parliament and then for hovering in the middle. Fourth position, which was also present in the colonies to some extent, were those of the Mennonites, some of the Moravians, some of the Church of the Brethren people who felt that all warfare was illegitimate under God and that therefore warfare against Parliament was illegitimate as well. Christian pacifists were a smaller group, but they raised their voices against all warfare and violence. Quaker Anthony Benizet published many tracts against the war. Christ positively enjoins us to love our enemies, to bless them that curse us, to do good to those that hate us, and pray for them that despitefully use and persecute us. On the other hand, war requires of its votaries that they kill, destroy, lay waste, and to the utmost of their power, distress and annoy, and in every way and manner, deprive those they esteem their enemies of support and comfort. The Revolutionary War dragged on for eight long and bloody years. And after the smoke of battle cleared, America's founding fathers created a new nation that took seriously the idea of religious freedom. This set the stage for an unprecedented diversity in religious belief and practice. After the American Revolution and after the First Amendment to the American Constitution, there were not very many people left who wanted to have a formal church-state establishment, who wanted official government connections with religion. But almost everybody, even those founding fathers who were not particularly religious themselves, almost everyone wanted to see religion active in public life as a guarantor of morality of what was then called virtue. This, for believing people, was what had always taken place. Uh, Christianity is promoted so that Christian values can permeate a society. As James Madison, the Constitution's principal author, expressed it, We are teaching the world the great truth that governments do better without kings and nobles than with them. The merit will be doubled by the other lesson, that religion flourishes in greater purity without than with the aid of government. It would be very unfair to Christians from 33 after Christ to 1492 or 1776 to suggest there wasn't reform, but always in the blanket of the state church. It was assumed that the Jesuits, the Benedictines, the Lutherans, the Reformed would, as social policy, try to reform. By the 1800s, the churches, through their voluntary activities, had already raised more money for reform and human need than the federal government had done. So if you want to deal with poverty, hunger, joblessness, deprivation, uh, all the great evils of the day, who's going to do it? Uh, churches. For Presbyterian educator William McGuffey, the cause was the moral education of American youth. America was adopting a nationwide system of public education, and McGuffey's eclectic readers provided simple moral lessons in honesty, industry, sobriety, and Sabbath keeping. McGuffey's readers have sold more than 100 million copies and still sell thousands of copies a year. For Congregationalist Minister Lewis Dwight, the cause was prison reform. As an agent for the American Bible Society, Dwight visited many prisons, and he was appalled by the abuses and inhumane conditions he saw there. His work in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania led to nationwide prison reform that served as a model around the world. And both Presbyterian revivalist Charles Finney and Congregationalist educator Mary Lyon argued that for real social reform to take hold, women would need to play a bigger role in society. But women were already playing an important role in American life. For Unitarian Dorothea Dix, the cause was the treatment of the mentally ill. Dix, who had suffered a nervous breakdown herself, saw firsthand how asylums abused their patients 
and her expose of these problems shamed Massachusetts and then other states into improving the way they housed and cared for society's most vulnerable members. One of the most celebrated female reformers was Elizabeth Ann Seton, a convert to Catholicism who served widows and orphans and became the first American-born saint. What was the first rule of our dear Savior's life? You know it was to do his Father's will. Well then, the first purpose of our daily work is to do the will of God. Second is to do it in the manner he wills. And third is to do it because it is his will. Women in the 19th century were involved in a vast array of social and civic efforts that grew directly out of their faith, directly out of their commitment to uh, the view that all persons are moral equals. They are all equally children of God. So you see women playing a quite visible role uh, in American church history. O oh, Church of Christ, read the signs of the times. Is not this power the spirit of him whose kingdom is yet to come and whose will is to be done on earth as it is in heaven? But who may abide the day of his appearing? For that day shall burn like an oven, and he shall appear as a swift witness against those that oppress the hireling in his wages and that turn aside the stranger in his right. And he shall break in pieces the oppressor. Harriet Beecher Stowe was the daughter of influential Congregationalist preacher Lyman Beecher. After Stowe experienced a spiritual rebirth during a revival at Yale, she became a crusader in the effort to abolish slavery. Her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, became an overnight sensation after it was published in 1852. Others took up the abolitionist cause, including former slaves like Frederick Douglass. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization and your pure Christianity while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three million of your countrymen. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. Frederick Douglass was a member of the Methodist Episcopal Church of Zion and a former slave. Douglass became one of the most influential figures in the growing abolitionist movement, and he argued that slavery was a moral cancer on the nation. The, the Christian involvement in the American story of slavery is very complicated. There is, of course, always among African American communities uh, uh, just an internal sense that something's de desperately wrong about this system. And as there, there grew to be more black Christian communities from the 1770s onwards, there was a significant part of the American population that just knew God did not approve of the slave system. Meanwhile, other Christians, like Georgia Presbyterian Alexander Stevens, defended the institution of slavery. Our new government is founded upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. He, by nature or by the curse of Canaan, is fitted for that condition which he occupies in our system. It is indeed in conformity with the ordinance of the Creator. God has made one race to differ from another, as he has made one star to differ from another star in glory. The key element in, in the Christian approach to slavery in the 1830s and 40s was the subordination of the question of race. In the Bible, almost all of the slaves mentioned are white. 
in America, all of the slaves were of African descent. That fact required some complex reasoning in how the Bible was approached. These disagreements led to schisms in Presbyterian, Baptist, and Methodist denominations. And President Abraham Lincoln, like many others, were sad to see Christians taking opposing sides. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. The prayers of both could not be answered. The Almighty has his own purposes. Thomas Crowder, a Southern Methodist, rightly predicted that irreconcilable divisions in churches would lead to irreversible divisions in the nation. A civil division of this great confederation may follow, and then hearts will be torn apart, master and slave arrayed against each other, brother in the church against brother, and the North against the South. By the time it was over, America's Civil War caused more than 600,000 deaths, a number that is equal to the deaths in all other American wars combined. After the war, Amendments 13 and 15 outlawed slavery and gave ex-slaves the right to vote. But soon after the dust of battle had settled, people of faith were turning their attention to other grave social problems. As the 19th century gave way to the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution began changing the lives of millions of Americans in profound ways. As more families moved to big cities so people could work in the factories, Christians began applying their faith to a host of new and uniquely modern social problems. As industrialization and urbanization bred new forms of poverty and despair, a new band of rebels with a cause set out to proclaim a new social gospel. Father Edward McGlynn, was a Catholic priest who became a passionate social reformer after he was assigned to a working class parish of some 25,000 souls in New York City. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Jane Addams founded Hull House in Chicago's poverty-stricken 19th Ward, which was home to many immigrants. Addams was raised as a Quaker and later became a Presbyterian and her activism covered a wide range of concerns. But the two people who would be the leaders of the growing social gospel movement were Washington Gladden and Walter Rauschenbusch. Congregationalist minister Washington Gladden was a religious activist who was called the father of the social gospel. In his book, The Church and Modern Life, Gladden argued that salvation was not for individuals alone, but for society as well. The Christian church has its great work still before it, and that it only needs to free itself from its entanglements and gird itself for its testimony to become the light of the world. The church has a great work to do in awakening the public conscience to forms of injustice which are so involved and concealed that our attention is not fixed upon them. Even more influential was Baptist pastor Walter Rauschenbusch, who was born the year the Civil War began and who died the year World War I ended. Serving a church on the edge of New York City's notorious Hell's Kitchen neighborhood, Rauschenbusch combined a deep spirituality with a passion to serve people who faced unemployment, crime, malnutrition, and disease. He presented his vision of the social gospel in his most famous book, Christianity, and the social crisis. Christ spoke of the difference between the hireling shepherd who flees and the owner who loves the sheep. Our system has made the immense majority of industrial workers mere hirelings. 
Under the old system, the workman owned the simple tools of his trade. Today, the working people have no part nor lot in the machines with which they work. The existence of a large class of population without property rights in the material they work upon and the tools they work with, and without claim to the profits resulting from their work, must have subtle and far-reaching effects on the character of this class and on the moral tone of the people at large. Perhaps the most well-known advocate of the social gospel was a Congregationalist minister from Kansas named Charles Sheldon, who wrote the best-selling book, In His Steps. The book imagines what might happen if people ask themselves this simple question, what would Jesus do? The answer, according to Sheldon and many other rebels with a cause, was that Jesus would roll up his sleeves, attack America's social problems, and help usher in the kingdom of God here and now. While the prophets of the social gospel attacked a wide range of complex social problems, another group of reformers focused on one sin they believed to be the cause of so much pain and suffering, the abuse of alcohol. And while some Christians responded to alcohol by caring for its victims at a growing number of urban rescue missions, others, including many women activists, campaigned to make demon run illegal. They arrived at the first saloon and they asked to come in. Some of the saloon keepers were so embarrassed they said, why no, you, you can't come in. And so the women knelt in the snow in the sidewalk and prayed and begged them to close. And the men's conscience were pricked and they did. And some of the saloon keepers were a little more brazen and they said, oh, you want to come in? Okay. So they let them come in and they laid their Bibles on the bar, they read scripture, they prayed, and they asked them to close, and those men closed. And this was what we considered the real beginning of the crusade, and it swept across the country into many communities, over 200, and in a few months, it was an amazing report. In 1879, Methodist Francis Willard became president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Like other anti-alcohol crusaders, Willard saw drink as a chief source of modern ills and she dismissed those who argued for drinking in moderation. Moderation is the shoddy life belt which promises safety, but only tempts into danger and fails in the hour of need. Most men become drunkards by trying to drink moderately and failing. While later anti-liquor crusaders like Baptist activist Carrie Nation would get more attention, Willard worked behind the scenes to transform the crusade against liquor into a national obsession. For some, the crusade against alcohol became mixed up with anti-German and anti-immigrant anger. But for Presbyterian preacher Billy Sunday, the opposition to alcohol was all about sin. A theatrical preacher who had once been a hard-drinking professional baseball player, Sunday promised that America would be almost perfect after alcohol was gone. The slums will soon only be a memory. We will turn our prisons into factories and our jails into storehouses and corn cribs. Men will walk upright now. Women will smile and children will laugh. Hell will forever be for rent. Not everyone believed that controlling alcohol would transform America into a heaven on earth, but many people thought it would improve things for everyone. There are two great tragedies in life, not getting what you want and getting what you want. American Protestants got what they wanted, namely the prohibition of alcoholic beverage. And the impulse behind that originally was very good because uh, it was a terrible social issue. At the entrance to every mine, at the entrance to every factory, there are saloons set up, people come on, there are no social agencies. That paycheck is what a family of six is supposed to live off, and they get seduced by that. Something had to happen, and people of goodwill started toward that. Prohibition later came to be more uh, punitive. You were more angry at the drinker than you were sympathetic, and I think it uh, demonstrates that a Forced change, which doesn't change the heart along the way anywhere, won't last. There was even an effort to eliminate the use of alcoholic communion wine in churches. A doctor 
named Thomas Welch applied the process of pasteurization, the grape juice, to produce Dr. Welch's unfermented wine, which we know today as Welch's grape juice. In time, many churches drank Welch's instead of alcoholic communion wine. The crusade against alcohol culminated in the Volstead Act, which prohibited the sale and consumption of alcohol beginning in January 1920. But prohibitions promised paradise never arrived. Instead of making America sinless and dry, prohibition seemed to make it even wilder and wetter. Millions of formerly law-abiding Americans were downing alcohol in thousands of illegal speakeasies. Liquor became America's biggest industry, with billions of dollars going into the pockets of well-organized crime families, some of which used alcohol profits to build illegal empires that remain powerful today. In 1933, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution repealed prohibition making liquor legal once again. Today, Christians look back at prohibition as a powerful lesson on the potential dangers of legislating morality. There's an awful lot of good that can be said about the prohibition movement in the United States. During the, the period when the prohibition amendment was in effect, public health in the United States improved considerably. Public health, public morality, Crime, however, did not improve to the degree that the, the strong proponents of prohibition had said. The damage that was done was, on the one side, to lessen caution about the misuse of alcohol, and on the other side, perhaps to uh, frighten Christian believers off of trying to promote, promote social reform. Now, obviously, we've come back in, in the later part of the 20th century with strong Christian advocacy for civil rights, strong Christian advocacy for uh, pro-life movements, and strong Christian advocacy for, for many other things. My hope is that as these necessary movements continue into the present, they will learn the lessons for good and for ill of what transpired in the fight against uh, alcohol. In the 1950s, the sin of racism continued to make life miserable for American blacks who were denied their share of the American dream. In 1954, a young man named Martin Luther King Jr. was called to pastor the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. The next year, Montgomery became the birthplace of the civil rights movement when Rosa Parks and black ministers rallied thousands of people to stage the Montgomery bus boycott. King had studied the nonviolent methods of Gandhi in Divinity School, and now he found himself at the center of a movement that was growing rapidly in black churches. The default position of many Southern white pastors was to resist the civil rights movement. Others, while sympathetic, believed it was moving too fast. North Carolina-born evangelist Billy Graham was one of these but nonetheless led by personal example, desegregating his evangelistic meetings, beginning with the 1953 Chattanooga Crusade, a year before the Supreme Court ruled to desegregate the nation's schools in Brown versus the Board of Education. During one of his many nights spent behind bars, King responded to his Christian critics with his letter from the Birmingham jail. My dear fellow clergymen, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. For years now I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This weight has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. 
1965, King led thousands of blacks and others in a march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, in support of voting rights, rights that had been promised to blacks following the Civil War. Marching along with King were rabbis and clergymen from the North, as well as more than 400 Catholic priests and nuns. The struggle for human rights and civil rights was rooted uh, in the faith, in the moral imperatives of the faith. And so that uh, Martin believed, as we all did, that uh, our job as preachers was to not only help people make heaven their home, but to make their homes here heavenly as well. And it wasn't until the 60s that the church sort of assumed its position. Our, our basic argument was on what thus says the Lord. Christians in America still apply their faith to the world outside the church doors. And religion has been an important social force for the last half century. In the past few decades, one of the most important groups of moral crusaders has been made up of evangelicals. The view among them was really, we're not going to enter the civic square. We're going to keep to ourselves and cultivate our own garden, so to speak. Um, but increasingly they found a voice and there were so many social questions that concerned evangelical believers that uh, they decided that becoming politically active, civically active, was the only way to have some influence on the overall direction the society took. So the view of both evangelicals and Catholics was that these are not Catholic and evangelical questions. You know, these are common good questions. These are questions for the entire society. And we have a voice, we have something to say about this, and we should enter uh, the civic sphere in order to say it. People of faith have brought attention to issues like abortion, gay rights, the ordination of gays and lesbians, divorce laws, obscenity, and pornography. People feel strongly about issues concerning sexuality and children, and the debates between opposing sides in these battles can be contentious. But as we have seen, heated debates over important issues have been an important part of America's religious and social life for centuries. And there is no sign that such debates will stop anytime soon. <laughs>